Okay, welcome guys, friends and colleagues to our discussion of lecture two in criminal law in Ghana. I'm sure when you watched the first video when we tried to introduce criminal law, we explained to you that in the subsequent videos, we're going to discuss what constitutes a crime. How do we determine that an action should be criminalized or not? What is the difference between civil wrongs and criminal liabilities and all that? We spoke about that. Now, in this video, we will discuss what is a crime in Ghana's criminal law. What do we mean by a crime? Well, for us to determine what a crime is, basically, there are always two considerations that are used in establishing whether an act is criminal or an act ought to be criminalized or, or not. So what are those two considerations? The first of them is that a crime is a public wrong. A crime is a public wrong. What do we mean by a public wrong? Now, you remember that we explained that when you take, for example, Ghana's constitution, Article 19, Article, uh, Article 12, Clause 2, which we mentioned, it says that every human being has got fundamental human rights. And these fundamental human rights, he is entitled to enjoy them, subject to the interest of the public. So every Ghanaian who walks the Ghanaian soil or who works the soil in Ghana is entitled to these human rights, these fundamental rights of enjoyment. So the only extent to which we can try to control the particular interest that a person will want to enjoy as against the others of the public is to find a way to control it. And we mentioned that criminal law was a means of helping us to do that. So when we say a crime, a crime is what we prescribe to be Okay, as a means of restricting people from interfering with the private rights of others or the private interests or human rights of other people. So we mentioned, for example, that if you take the right to life, everybody has got the right to live. So if someone attempts or by his nature, he tries to stop another person from living, that is, he attempts to take his life, I mean, an attempt to either kill him or anything like that, we say that it is a crime. So a crime has got, as we said, the first characteristic of being a public wrong. That is it. Whatever you do, the state considers that it is a way that you are unjustifiably also interfering with the rights of other people. And therefore, it is a consideration for that act to be considered criminal. Someone may be wondering that, in what sense does it interfere with the rights of people? Let me give you an example so that you get a sense of why we are saying that some of these things would have an effect on the public. A young man who had probably gone to medical school for about six plus eight years, one of the finest doctors that Ghana has never known. Let me just mention that I'm just using a hypothetical example. So one day he closes from work, his official hospital duties, and goes home to his wife and kids. Now around 1 a.m., he hears a violent knock on his door. Unsure as to why the person was knocking on the door, he walked up to the, to the, to the door. His wife had probably tried to restrain him in terms of, oh, Kwame, Kojo, don't go. I don't know who is there. He said, oh, I'm a relax. I just want to see who is at the door. The person, the doctor now gets to the door. He opens the door. And lo and behold, there was a man in a black black clover, like a face mask. He didn't know what he wanted. He asked him, what do you want? Before he could say Jack, the guy pulled out a gun, the, uh, the max person pulled out a gun and fired him three times to his chest. He fell down. His wife was overcome with fear and screaming, calling out the name of the husband. This particular attacker proceeded into the bedroom, raped the wife and shot her same. There are two children who were also sleeping in the other room who were so terrified. They just couldn't know what, what, what they were going to do. The attackers went into the bedroom and out of some divine providence, they decided not to attack them and left. Now, guys, the question is, can you begin to imagine what the state would have lost first? Because if this man, this doctor, the following day, he has an appointment, and there may be patients who are waiting for him so that he attends to them, he doesn't show up for work. So what happens to all those other people who are suffering various ailments and they are at the hospital? They get to see no doctor unless quick interventions are made. So we realized that the benefit that the state was going to get from him, first of all, we've lost it because he's no more alive. Whatever expertise that he had in the medical practice is not available to serve us. Don't you think that that is a wrong? 
that affects all of us as Ghanaians. So you see, that is what we mean by a public wrong. Let's look at the case of his wife too. His wife was a head teacher, a very astute teacher, who was reputed for exemplary teaching and administrative skills. The following day, the teachers were looking up to her. She didn't show up in school. The kids thought that, oh, Madame had traveled, so it was a holiday, and they were screaming, helter and skelter, running around campus. What happens to the activities, the academic activities of the day? Is equally going to suffer. Those kids in those schools, they are Ghanaian children. They are entitled to be taught. But the headmistress is not there. The teacher is not there. We suffer as a state. The kids, they were traumatized. So probably they had to leave the city and go and live with their grandmother in the village. Whatever potential that they might have had, which being the city could have afforded them, they've lost it. They have to go and be with, for example, their grandmother in the village. And God knows if we ever see the star that was born in them. So you would understand that if a crime occurs, if a wrongdoing occurs to any member of the citizen, you can begin to see the ripple effect on the general state of Ghanaians. So that is why we are saying that any act that has got the, 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 the propensity, the capacity to substantially inflict harm to our general interest of the public, we have to find a way and stop it. And that is one of the considerations why we call that a crime. You understand that? So a crime is a public wrong. It is a wrong that you don't just hurt the person, you hurt the entire Ghanaian people. This is what we consider when we're going to assess whether an act has to be a crime or not. So you see this going into stealing. You see it in murder. You see it in rape. You see it in all those other kinds of actions. Think about the ripple effect on the Ghanaian people. And that is one of the considerations that we say it is a public wrong. Also, with relative to calling crimes acts of public wrong, it also manifests itself in the procedure. You know, if people have got personal rights, like personal issues, let's say I do business with somebody, I give him some money, I'm expecting something for him to give to me. You know, those are personal issues that we can think about. But if you look at the way we also deal with actions that are criminal in the court process, it helps you to understand why we call those like a public wrong. It is a public wrong because even in the procedure in which we deal with it, you realize that we use public resources to follow up with the prosecution. For example, if someone commits a crime, let's still use the case of the doctor who was murdered. Eventually, the police on an intelligence arrested the suspect whom they found that he had some, some links to the murder of this doctor. Then they take him to the police station. They arrest him. He's taken to the police station. He's processed. They take him to court. The law of Ghana allows the attorney general or mandates the attorney general to actually go ahead with the prosecution. And this he does with the assistance with the police by delegating some authority to the police. So the first day that the suspect or the accused person is brought before, before court, he comes to meet not the doctor, not the wife who is dead, not the kids, not a member of the, 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 the family. He is going to meet a police prosecutor someone that the state has appointed to make sure that this action that the person has done, he is made to face criminal sanctions on that. You understand that? So you would realize that the manner in which you are trying to even prove the person wrong, the way that the trial process, there is a use of state resources, state legal support used by the Attorney General's Department to make sure that we can tell that problem. So the use of the state resources help us to also understand why we see that it is a public wrong. So guys, to this point, we've been able to establish that one of the considerations of a crime is a public wrong, an act that has the capacity to inflict substantial damage to the public interest. It can be criminalized in that sense. So that's the first characteristic of what a crime is. Let's look at the second characteristic. Now, the other characteristic of a crime is a moral wrong. You may not believe it, but the development of criminal law or what constitutes a crime is not just a public wrong per se. That is one side of the argument. The other part is that crimes are also characterized by the fact that they are morally wrong. So if you take Ghana's criminal code, for example, the Act 29, that spells out what we have laid down by Parliament as the obvious crimes, okay, amongst other things, you will realize the same thing also going in there that there are some of the crimes that it is there because of moral wrongs. You get it. It is there because of moral wrongs. Let's take, for example, prostitution. You know prostitution is a, is a crime in Ghana, in Ghanaian law, under Ghana's law. 
if someone is into prostitution, it's a criminal offense. Or if another person even procures another lady or a, a minor into acts of prosecution, prostitution, it is also a criminal offense. Now the question is that, why do we make an act a criminal offense? I'm a man, I feel I want to release my sexual tension. Then there's a woman who is willing to allow me to do that with her for a fee. Why should that be a problem? Why should that be a problem for another person who sits somewhere? So you may be wondering that. The question is that, though a person may not directly be affected, but there is a question of the morality. The question of the morality. The concept of it being morally wrong. To allow a man who may be married or a woman or a young lady who for want of some physical needs or some economic benefits have to allow another person to sleep with her and take money. That is inconceivable. So that is part of the reason why certain acts may also be what? Be criminalized. It may not necessarily be because it inflicts substantially on another person's interest or the public interest, but the concept of it being wrong, a moral wrong, it's also one of the considerations that we make an act like that a criminal offense. If you take the criminal act, for example, the Act 29 again, and you look at Section 79, Section 79 also mentions or mentions an act that we call trying to deny someone access to necessities of health and life. You know, the law in Ghana is that if a man gets married to a woman or a woman vice versa, they are married, there is a responsibility that as long as there's a subsistence of the marriage, the man has to provide for the woman likewise. Providing for the woman will also mean, or providing for his household will also mean that he needs to make sure that he does not deny them access to health care, access to necessary, necessary supply, shelter, and all those things. If it is within the person's capacity to do that, and he denies the person access, it's a criminal offense. So if there's a man who has a wife, and his wife tells her that, oh, Kwame, I'm not feeling well today. Can you give me some money? To go to the hospital and the man refuses to allow the woman to go to the hospital he does not do everything in his reasonable care and power to get his wife to the hospital that is a criminal offense he can be arrested and brought before the courts of law the question is that what's the problem why is that the woman just doesn't just divorce the man and go his way that is one one side of the argument but you see there is a concept of morality in there we feel that that problem is morally wrong for you to marry somebody and deny the person access to the things that he needs in life, like necessities of life, food, water, shelter, clothing, etc. It's immoral for us to think like that. So you would see that the other consideration that we, we mentioned here is that when an act is also morally wrong, it can also constitute a proper ground for it to be decided as a crime. There has been controversy several, in several places as to whether the immoral concept should be a ground for trying to make an act a crime. Now, when the common law was developing, or way back in England, such matters came up. And a very familiar case, which we call Shaw versus the Director of Public Prosecutions, one of the learned justices in the case made a very profound statement that is of relevance to the subject matter as to whether or not morality ought to be the ground of dealing with a crime. Let's see what Lord Simmons said in that matter. Lord Simmons mentions in Shaw versus Director of Public Prosecutions, there remains in the courts of law a residual power to enforce the supreme and fundamental purpose of the law, to conserve not only the safety and order, but also the moral welfare of the state. Did you notice the statement by Lord Simons in his insurance direct, the director of public prosecutions? It's of persuasive effect for what, what we are discussing here. He mentions that there exists a residual power in the courts. That is, to make sure that the supreme and fundamental purpose of the law is preserved. That is the maintenance of the moral welfare of the society. So there has been arguments that the moral welfare of the society, it's a kind of a cement that keeps the, the bond of the Ghanaian society strong. And therefore, acts that have the potential of trying to weaken that moral fiber can also be proper grounds for that action to be criminalized. You understand that? So when we talk about a crime, I want to reiterate that. Actions that have a characteristic nature of being morally wrong, and we are saying that the moral standards being the moral standards of the society, can also be proper grounds for it to be criminalized. 
That is why you go to some countries, certain things that would be a crime here in Ghana, you go to another country, it may not be a crime. Part of it is because what does the country hold as its moral ethos? What is the status of their morality? When there is the existence of morality, the moral consideration is a proper ground for an act to also be considered a crime. Now, I'll take you to the Constitution, 1992. Article 20, it mentions a very important thing there to let us see whether or not in Ghana, that concept of public morality or morality, does it actually appear in Ghana's legal order? Let's see under Article 20 of the 1992 Constitution. Now, Article 20 of the 1992 Constitution, Clause 1, it mentions that, Clause 1, no property of any description or interest in or right over any property shall be compulsorily taken possession of or acquired by the state unless the following conditions are satisfied. A. The taking of possession or acquisition is necessary in the interest of defense, public safety, public order. Now watch. Public morality, public health, town and country planning, or the development or utilization of property in such a manner as to promote the public benefit. Did you notice that? So you will realize that in the Article 20, Clause 1 of 1992 Constitution, which even talks about compulsory acquisition, it says that the state can compulsorily acquire a property of whatever nature for the purposes of preserving public morality. So the point that we are trying to mention here is that and what is a crime has always got moral foundation. So in Ghana's legal order, we recognize that there is the existence of what we call public morality. There are certain things that reflect the morality of the Ghanaian people. The constitution recognizes that. So if there is any particular act that has or that endangers the public morals of Ghanaians, it will be proper grounds for it to be criminalized. You understand that? So some people, for example, were arguing in recent times whether or not Ghana's laws allow gays and lesbians to be allowed, their attempts to criminalize it and the law and all. You see, you, you get those kind of arguments. This is giving us a sense as to why it may not be entirely wrong if in Ghana's legal order the, 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 the legislators or it becomes necessary at a particular point in time that lesbianism or, or homosexuality is going to be criminalized. The grounds of this is that it will be on base of what? Public moral considerations. So if someone says that, oh, we can't allow that to happen. You can't. Why? Because under Ghana's legal order in our constitution, we recognize the concept of public morality. It is here in Ghana that there is something that we call public morality. The Ghanaian people have got a certain sociological fiber, a certain social ethos and culture so that it affects their morals. So if to that extent, there is going to be a legislative attempt to, on the basis of that public morals, restrict an action. It could be grounds of what? Public, uh, it could be grounds of a crime. So you see that also reflecting in indecent exposure. You know in Ghana's criminal laws, if you strip naked or you walk in a way, in Nata, that kind of exposes your, your, your private parts as a woman or even as a man, it can be grounds for you to be prosecuted. The question is, Oh, I have, I, my body is mine. So why am I walking and I've shown my, my boobs or whatever? And it has to be a crime. The question is that we recognize what we call public morality. So guys, the, the, the fundamental point we are trying to establish is that when we talk about a crime, it could be, it could have the characteristic of being a public wrong in the sense that the effect of that action substantially inflicts damage to the overall interest of the state, as I mentioned in the, in the murdered doctor's example that I used as a comparison. You saw how the analysis also went. Then it could also be a characteristic of a crime that because it is a moral wrong, it has been found necessary to make sure that we use the instruments of the state to restrict that particular action. But in any case, when we say a crime, we actually inherently also mean a criminal offense. Also mean a criminal offense. And that is the most foundational aspect of what we call a crime. Whether it is a public wrong, whether it is a moral wrong, for something to be considered a crime, this is what the Constitution says. And in fact, it is the standard of all criminal offenses around the globe. Let's see in the Constitution, Article 19, Clause 5 and 11. Article 19 of the 1992 Constitution. Article 19, Clause 5 of the 1992 Constitution. It mentions, or it provides, a person shall not be charged with 
or held to be guilty of a criminal offense which is founded on an act or omission that did not at the time it took place constitute an offense. Did you notice what was said in the 1902 Constitution, Article 19, Clause 5? It says that a person cannot be charged with a criminal offense or for an omission of an act as an offense. If at the time that the person did that, it was not in existence in Ghanaian statute as an offense. What therefore means that whether it was a public wrong or a moral wrong, there has to be a black letter provision. When I say black letter provision, there has to be an express provision, a written down statute that prescribes that action. It has to be written down to the extent that everybody in the state understands that this particular action is prohibited. If that clarity was not given, there existed no black letter law that pointed to the fact that an act was a criminal offense, it cannot be constituted as a criminal offense. So in simple terms, for something to be a crime in Ghana, it has to be dictated in a statute. There has to be a statute, there has to be a law, an act of parliament that someone can refer to and read and see that, oh, this particular action that we are referring to, the law says I should not do that. If you can't find it in any statute book, it does not constitute a criminal offense. So the public wrongs and the moral wrongs are just the philosophical underpinnings, the rationales behind what we call a crime. But the real thing is that after all these rationales are there, it has to be put down on paper so that we understand that this is a crime. So a crime is what has been put down on a paper as a crime. That's the position of the law in, 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 in Ghana's legal order. Let's also continue to clause 11 of the same article 19 of the 1992 Constitution. Clause 11. No person shall be convicted of a criminal offense unless the offense is defined and the penalty for it is prescribed in a written law. You saw that. So again, Clause 11 of the Article 19 goes to confirm that no person can be punished for a criminal offense unless the offense and the penalty for that offense is prescribed in a written law. So if there is no written law that determines that a particular action is a crime and the offense is prescribed, it does not constitute a crime. But basically, we are trying to say that for an action to be a crime, it has to first have be either a public wrong, and we'll explain the characteristics, either it's a public wrong or it is a moral wrong. Either of them could be a grounds of it being a crime. But for the working activity of the society, for us to go for it in practical terms, if that, after it has been considered as a public wrong or a moral wrong, that particular action has to be put down in a statute, in a written law, and the offense for that should be prescribed. That is the grounds upon which an action is a crime. So you would realize that in Ghana's legal order or several places that we go, there is always a proper grounds for certain actions to be considered reprehensible and criminalized because it affects the moral fiber of the state. You understand that? Likewise, we can also have it being a public wrong in the sense that substantial injustice or pain will be, will be afflicted to the rest of the populace if we allow such particular actions to continue. So at this juncture, we now understand what a crime is. We now go now, going ahead to explain the constitutional basis and the statutory basis for all these analysis that we have done. Having said that, stick and stay as we move on in our next discussion, in the next video, where we will discuss what are the elements of a crime. If someone is brought before the court of law, what would be the rationale for us to say that this thing that a person has done, he has committed a criminal offense. What is within a criminal offense? Okay, Because we've mentioned that it is a public wrong and a moral wrong. All right, we get that. But what is it in that particular action? What is it in those moral wrongs or public wrongs for which reason the person has been brought there? We'll discuss the elements of crime. Stay. Tuned.